everybody, and welcome back to another week of discussion in media, culture, and identity. This week, we're diving into some key media studies theories, and we're looking at how two seminal media theorists, Henry Jenkins and Wendy Chun, conceptualize our contemporary mediated landscape and the dynamics and stakes associated with it. So to dive in, Henry Jenkins pioneered this concept of convergence culture. And convergence culture refers to how information flows between platforms and it has a very sort of porous nature to it as a result. And by flowing between different platforms and whatnot, different audiences engage in a kind of migratory behavior where they're going to seek out the different entertainment experiences they want on those various platforms. And that's because, you know, we create these dynamics where, um, you know, information is flowing so easily between platforms. Media industries, in turn, respond to that by trying to stay ahead of the curve and capitalize on audiences' interests and, you know, migratory behaviors across platforms in order to, you know, make sure that they're generating profits based on those interests, um, that they're expanding different media empires in ways that, um, you know, are going to uh, respond to, to consumer interests and whatnot. So... We see how with the concept of convergence culture, there's a very clear interplay between industry and audience. And with that, Henry Jenkins is very interested in the role that audiences play in shaping different mediated texts. So he sees that there is a very clear grassroots power to audiences engaging in mediated texts and thinks about how that power can be harnessed for, you know, different political possibilities um, outside of, you know, just contributing to, um, you know, particular uh, specific texts. So a few examples of specific texts that would highlight this concept very well are, um, you know, the, the Kardashians. So when Henry Jenkins pioneered this concept in 2007, he wasn't necessarily thinking about the Kardashians, but here we are, and they embody convergence culture in very interesting ways. Uh, they started with a reality TV show. Um, they have you know, uh, taken over various uh, influencer spaces on social media. Um, there have been phone games created about the Kardashians that have come and gone, uh, haven't been uh, clearly that successful. Um, memes, you know, thinking about the memes that abound when it comes to, uh, you know, seeing the, the goofy stuff that the Kardashians have done. And it goes to show that all of these various texts that live on different platforms contribute to our understandings of the convergence culture text that is the Kardashians. So the Kardashians, not only, you know, an empire in the sense of, you know, generating a whole lot of money, but we could see them as being a mediated empire and that they, you know, have managed to, you know, bring in all of these different platforms into their space and in ways that, you know, generates a whole bunch of money. Uh, Star Wars is also a classic example of a convergence culture text in the sense that, you know, it started with these wildly popular movies and then moved into, you know, comics that, uh, you know, contributed to uh, understandings of the, the Star Wars universe. Then, you know, ultimately going into video games and spin-off TV shows like The Mandalorian. Um, and now we're in an era of Baby Yoda memes. So thinking about how all of these various texts, you know, contribute to um, how we understand Star Wars. So a key aspect of understanding convergence culture is thinking about how it's a narrative universe that is built across all these different platforms and characters develop across these different platforms. And with that, audiences, you know, contribute to shaping the, the media empire. So, you know, through tweets shared, through memes shared, um, you know, through uh, different stories that are submitted as a uh, fan fiction to, you know, things like Star Wars or Star Trek where you know, that's, that, I feel like that's a little dated in the sense of fan fiction <laughs> stories, 
but it still happens where, you know, people create these stories that they see, you know, the narrative universe uh, going in the direction of. Um, we'll submit those to showrunners and, you know, sometimes they impact the, um, the narrative universe. So that uh, more, uh, you know, it's more likely for that to happen on something like Twitter nowadays or, um, you know, like some other social media space. But, um, you know, in the 2000s, uh, people were submitting fan fiction stories and it was influencing Star Trek or, um, you know, Star Wars uh, narrative universes and whatnot. So... Henry Jenkins also outlines, you know, these eight traits of a new media landscape that we're going to be talking about on the discussion board this week. And um, just to highlight a couple of them to, to dive into uh, what Henry Jenkins was all about in, um, you know, thinking about a mediated landscape. He's thinking about how our mediated world is innovative. Um, so, you know, it seems very obvious, but Henry Jenkins is trying to interrogate the concept of innovation in the sense that we tend to consider sort of ongoing creations, you know, the bigger, the better, the newer, um, that that's, you know, uh, holistically a good thing when, you know, we could, you know, kind of deconstruct that idea a little bit and think about how, um, you know, innovation does not always equal good. Um, innovation um, and, you know, forward momentum can move at such an, you know, it can accelerate at such a fast pace that um, we're not necessarily thinking about how folks are adapting to those changes and what the stakes are involved in, you know, how those changes are impacting people. Um, so, uh, you know, we talk a lot today about, um, you know, different uh, media industries, you know, disrupting, um, you know, various uh, mediated spaces like Netflix disrupted how we understand, you know, what it looks like to, uh, you know, engage with film and television. Um, and, you know, thinking about that, that notion of disruption equaling something that is positive, um, it's something that media studies theorists will dive into and in thinking about, you know, uh, generally, you know, what are, what are the costs associated with um, continuously making these huge changes. So, um, Henry Jenkins is also thinking about how new media is appropriative, um, and it's appropriative in the sense that it's continuously recontextualizing material and remixing material in order to create, you know, new understandings and new texts. So, you know, an example of this could be seen even in, you know, SoundCloud rappers taking, you know, different bits and pieces of other songs and then remixing them into new tracks. So it creates a different context for, you know, those original um, bits of material um, in the new tracks and whatnot. So, you know, memes are a great example of recontextualizing material because how often do we see a media event happen where, you know, a picture is taken and um, then that picture becomes just, you know, a viral a way to, to communicate other understandings of the picture itself that are totally divorced from, you know, the original meaning of it. So then it gets, you know, woven into this tapestry of, of various uh, conceptions of the picture. So um, another uh, trait that um, Henry Jenkins highlights is how a new media is unequal. So he's thinking about how um, the various dynamics of power and privilege that we were talking about last week tie into our new media landscape and impact how, you know, we engage with media. And, you know, we're thinking about how new media can be unequal in, you know, the very clear sense of, you know, say, kids having laptops to be able to do their virtual school work on during COVID um, and, you know, how the lack of a laptop is going to impact educational outcomes. But we're also thinking about how, you know, unequal access to, um, you know, information can take shape through visibility. So visibility in the sense of, you know, if the Instagram Explore page is only featuring white influencer content, 
um, that's going to impact the visibility of, you know, various influencers of color. And with that, and we'll talk about this in the weeks to come, algorithms come into play in a huge way um, in terms of, you know, shaping our understandings of, you know, unequal, um, the unequal uh, playing field of new media and whatnot. And thinking about how algorithms they shape what content we're exposed to, but they're created by humans with their own biases, with their own blind spots. So we'll talk about that in the weeks to come. But one trait uh, that Henry Jenkins talks about that I want to highlight is the everyday nature of new media. So every day, uh, in the sense of, um, <laughs> you know, it's pretty obvious, like it's so habitual and ingrained in our daily life. I don't need to tell you all that um, cell phones now function as a kind of appendage for us that, you know, there's such thing as, you know, phantom uh, vibration syndrome where people, you know, feel like their phone is continuously lighting up or vibrating and you're, you know, continuously mindful about looking at your phone and just being aware of uh, what is what is coming through, through your cellular device. Um, so Henry Jenkins' notion of the everyday nature of new media overlaps with uh, Wendy Chun's conceptualization of the new media landscape in that Wendy Chun is very concerned with how media seems to matter most when it doesn't seem to matter at all. So what does she mean by that? Um, so thinking about how when media is so ingrained, it's so entrenched in our daily experience, the fact that we're not even thinking about it gestures at the need to really interrogate the importance of it. So um, Henry Jenkins sees that there's a danger in, you know, having this uh, profound familiarity with our media environment in that he describes it as, you know, our media environment basically functions as, you know, a fish's relationship to water. We just see it as the thing we're surrounded by and don't even question it. So thinking about, you know, what does it look like to question it? And Wendy Chun questions it through looking at our habits. So in Wendy Chun interrogating what do our digital habits say about us, she's thinking about how there are these muddy distinctions now between what we see as public and private, what we see as intimate and social, and with those muddy distinctions, so the boundaries between those ideas being blurred, it's really impacting how we relate to others, how we conceptualize ourselves, um, and with that, you know, generally what stakes media has for, um, you know, our, our socialization, um, you know, and how, how we see ourselves, you know, as individuals. So we'll talk a little bit about the, the different, um, you know, uh, dynamics of um, binary oppositions that um, uh, Wendy Chun explores. So, you know, she's thinking about how, you know, things that have been traditionally understood as binary opposites, like public and private, or hype and reality, surveillance and entertainment, um, you know, there's a lot of muddied waters there today. And I, I'm sure that you all will have very thoughtful insights about where you see those um, distinctions getting blurred um, in relation to, you know, how you all have, you know, navigated media and whatnot. So, um, we'll talk more about this on the Discord board, and I look forward to, to hearing what you all have to say, especially after such a great discussion this past week. Um, you know, it was a really great Zoom call, and i um, just looking forward to, to the next uh, conversation that we have. So uh, talk to you all there.